We are in Philippians 3. Now, um, let's, we're only going to cover verses 10 and 11. There's a lot of verses 10 and 11. And, uh, but let's go ahead and start in verse 7 and just read through this. But Paul says this, says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now, remember that. We discussed that Wednesday night, knowing, knowing Christ. For this sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Um, I just want to mention here, uh, just as a reminder, that one of the things that we unpack in looking at the end, really the middle of verse 9, where it says that uh, faith in Christ, um, it actually it actually should be translated as the faith of Christ, uh, in the sense that the faithfulness of Christ is the righteousness of God on earth, and we enter into His righteousness because of what He accomplished, and so um, there's nothing in the Greek that that validates the translation of faith in Christ, even though it's not wrong to say faith in Christ. That's actually not what it says. It's the faith of Christ. And so our righteousness, our righteousness depends on not having faith in Christ, but our righteousness quite literally depends on Christ's faith when he was, when he was here in uh, doing the will of the Father. And all of this is, uh, all this would connect right back to, I mean, if you're just reading this letter through in one sitting, then all of this would just connect right back to chapter 2 where Jesus emptied himself. And so I want you to keep in mind, you remember the, the example of, who remembers the four examples in chapter 4? The four examples of, of emptying yourself or, or uh, not thinking uh, selfishly if, uh, when, when you conduct yourself. Who remembers the four examples? First one is Jesus. Then who are the other three? You remember? It was Epaphroditus and Timothy and Paul. And so he gives the illustrations of how they've set the example, but they're really following the example of Christ. Um, now, as we, as we look at the, idea that, the ideas that we're going to look at in verse 10 and 11, I want you to con- continue in your mind connecting it back to chapter 2. So verse 10, he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so in verse 10, um, he's looking at all of the things that are, as we talked about, his resume, his credentials, all that, and he says, all that is garbage to me. I count it as rubbish. Um, I willingly and gladly throw it all away in order that, verse 10, in order that, and now we have a, a sort of a list of things. And, and sometimes when you look at the English, it, it gets in the way of us seeing what would be normally thought of as just a sort of bullet points in a, in a, very, in a very clear way. If you were to just sort of outline this, what he's saying is, uh, first, that I may know him, number one. The second, that I may know the power of his resurrection. And, and literally, we'll get into this, and, and share his sufferings. That actually isn't what it says. It's, it's and know his sufferings. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute, though. But it's translated in a way that makes sense. But he's actually just bullet pointing. He says, that I may know him, that I may know the power of his resurrection. That I, that I may know his sufferings, or may know the fellowship of his sufferings. That's quite literally what it says. Becoming like him in death. And so becoming like him in death follows from the sharing in his sufferings. Um, that by any means possible I may attain from the resurrection, or attain the resurrection from the dead. And um, I think the New King James says, attain to the resurrection. Now, I want you to see that the, the structure here, he, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, 
and you have resurrection here, and then he says, share in his sufferings, being conformed to his death, that I may attain to the resurrection. So you have the resurrection bookending the sharing and sufferings and being conformed to his death. And so he, he is saying that he wants to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and we share in his sufferings, and he's, and he's essentially giving the formula for what is, his end goal is to know Christ and to share with the work that he's accomplished in his resurrection, but that in order to do that, he has to know his sufferings as well, becoming like him in his death so that he may attain the resurrection from the dead. And so he's, he's sort of um, repeating himself in reverse because that's, that's the way that we can logically know Christ is in particular sharing with Christ. And so when we think of the idea of knowing Christ, and I looked at this a little bit, uh, I looked at this a little bit on Wednesday, the idea of knowing Christ, um, I, I remember years ago, I, I mean maybe 20 years ago, I, just, I remember doing this study where I, I looked up what it means to know, or the word know, or knowledge. Now, in the, the first century, uh, and John actually uh, was one of, John, the Apostle John, uh, he combated what was called incipient Gnosticism, which is, and I don't like that term because it's confusing, but all that means is, is that you have you have sort of an early version of Gnosticism, and Gnosticism is a complicated idea anyway, because it has to do with certain people having a special knowledge that um, gives them access and that other people don't have that knowledge. Now, um, I, I feel like I kind of ran into this one time when I was having a study with people who believed that the Holy Spirit talked to them. And they had fairly inflated egos about they're like, well, I mean, you don't, you don't have the Holy Spirit talking into your ear like we do. We, we have a direct connection. We know things that you don't know. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what Gnosticism was in the first century, but the word Gnosticism is from the Greek term knowledge, gnosis. Uh, and the, the ver that's the noun. The verb is gnosko. But there's an also another, another uh, word for knowledge in Greek. It's called, it's oida. Now, so you have these two. Now, in English, you just have know or knowledge, K-N-O-W. And, and the context of what you're talking about depends on what kind of knowledge that is. Now, if you were to think back to Adam and Eve, um, how, how is, you might say, the consummation of their union described? How's, it, how's, that, how's that described? That Adam what? Eve. He knew, okay, so in the, in the Old Testament, you had, you only had one word, yada, that was the Hebrew word for knowledge or to know, but um, the, context, the context is what made you understand what exactly it meant. And so it was an intimate knowledge. Um, when you go to the New Testament, you have the two words, you have oida, which is sort of a, a face value, intellectual knowledge. I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, whereas gnosko is an is a, uh, experiential knowledge. Uh, it's, it's a knowledge in which I, I have an intimate understanding. Um, and so that's, that's the word that we find used here, that he may know Christ. So we're not talking about someone who says, well, I'm, I know who Jesus is. That's not what we're talking about. It's very, um, and, and this is, this is an important, important point to understand this, this type of knowledge. It isn't a matter of, of knowing who Jesus is. It's a matter of knowing Jesus. And so this has to do with something that is quite a bit deeper. It's not a matter of, oh, I heard of them. It's more of, I've spent time with them. Uh, I, I know who they are in and out. And so there's a connection, there's a union, there's a sharing in the things of that person, okay? Um, and so this goes back to um, I, what, what I mentioned was, is Jeremiah 31 is, the, is, is one of the prophecies of the new covenant. 
And he says that the new covenant is not like the old covenant. In the old covenant, when you were born into the covenant, you didn't know that you were in the covenant. And you didn't know who God was. And so in Jeremiah 31, 34, and 31 through 34 is actually quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 there at the end. You have a, let's see, I don't have it here. No, I don't. Okay. Um, what you have it, you have it quoted because the Hebrew writer is comparing the old law to the new law or the old covenant to the new covenant. And in particular, he says that within the new covenant, someone is not born into it. And then as they grow up, you have to teach them who they're in covenant with. The covenant of Christ is a covenant in which you hear about Jesus and then you come to him and you share with him and his work. So you have that intimate knowledge. You go from the oida knowledge to the gnosko or gnosis knowledge. And, and so you have this, uh, this difference where he says in Jeremiah 31, he says, No longer will anyone tell his neighbor and his brother, know the Lord. In other words, you won't be instructing them to learn who God is. Because in the new covenant, they will have heard of who God is. They will have heard of who Jesus is. And they have decided to come and know him in an intimate way. And so anyone who is part of the covenant of Christ is someone who already knows at face value, but then has chosen to come to know them in an intimate way. And so anyone in the new covenant, well, we don't have to tell them who Jesus is because they already know who he is. And so that's, that's a huge step. And that's the difference between the old and the new covenant. And one of the things I mentioned was, I heard this years ago from... Uh, Ken Fuel is a, 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 um, just a, a short lesson, and, and I remember him talking about this, the, the profound exchange between Peter and Jesus in Matthew 16, where, where he, he asks the, the apostles, Jesus asks the apostles, who do men say that I am? And then Peter says, well, there are lots of ideas right thrown out. He says, well, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but the Father who's in heaven. And he says, and you are Peter. And when you look at that for what it is, and you contrast that to the old covenant. The old covenant was, all right, are you a son or a descendant of Aaron? Okay, you can be part of the priesthood. And only one of those guys is the most, it goes into the most holy place and is the high priest. He goes, only goes in one time a year. And when you remember the stories of, of uh, the accounts of Moses going to the tabernacle where the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud was to ask God advice about certain things, right? And people would go to him and they would say, okay, what do we need to do? And he would go to God and he would ask them. Well, now it's Peter who is, who is Peter? Well, a lot of people like to look at this as change and they say, well, he's this transcendent sort of a person of a, he's the Pope, right? Or whatever. But in reality, who is he? He is a fisherman who who was emotional and said a lot more than he should have said. Um, I, I can imagine some of the, the uh, apostles standing around sometimes, maybe kind of their eyes got really big at what Peter was saying. Maybe they were thinking, well, I was thinking it, but I wasn't going to say it, right? So this is this fisherman guy here. He's kind of got a, a short fuse about what he, you know, that's the, that was Peter. Peter was just kind of an average guy. There wasn't anything special about him. And that's the point. The point is, is that Peter, who's a nobody, looks at deity and says, you're a deity. And deity looks back at Peter and says, and you're a nobody. And we're standing here talking face to face. And we know each other and we're spending time together. And that's the difference between the old and the new law as far as what is accomplished in Christ. Is that we now have this ability, as Paul says, I'll count everything but garbage in order that I might know him. And so we can't miss the, the depth and the profundity of that uh, because it, it is in its very essence, the whole point of the new covenant is that we know God in a way that we couldn't know him apart from his son. In, in uh, John 14, Thomas says, show us the father, Jesus. And he says, you spent so much time with me and you don't know who the Father is? He says, if you've spent time with me and you know who I am, then you know who the Father is. And, and look, we, and we can't read that and just say, well, okay, let's just move on to the next passage. No, we've we got to understand 
that what, what actually Jesus accomplishes by coming as a human being so that we can know who he is and that we can then share in what he did. And so, so Paul recognizes what we have to recognize about the gospel, the scheme of redemption, which is that the plan all along was for us to come into an intimate knowledge of God in relationship with him for eternity. And Paul says that has always been God's plan for every human being that's ever lived, and there isn't going to be anything that gets in the way of that. Everything else just goes out the window in order that I may know him. But then he, he spells out the formula for it. The formula for it is, is, okay, it's more than just the face value of knowing who somebody is, but what does it mean to know who Jesus is? And he says, well, knowing who Jesus is has to do with following in the footsteps of what Jesus did. And so someone doesn't truly know Jesus unless they've actually fallen in line with the example of Christ. They, they haven't identified with his work or experienced what he's done. Okay, let's see here. How far off of my notes am I? Um, yeah. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the ones that came to mind, one of my favorite passages, 2 Timothy 1.12, for this reason I also suffer these things, nevertheless, you know, I suffer these things, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. I've committed myself to him, I know who he is, I know him, I don't, I, I, I and that, see, I, even I stated it incorrectly there. It isn't that he knows who Jesus is. It's, it's he knows him. Not knows who he is, but he knows him. He's not, not a, a passing acquaintance, and he's a friend of a friend. It, there, there is a connection here, but, it's, but the, the depth of this is that it's a spiritual connection that happens when someone becomes a Christian. So someone, when someone enters into covenant, they enter into covenant and they share in the work of Christ. And so the knowing Christ means to enter into covenant, and the only way you enter into covenant is by sharing in his sufferings, being conformed to his death, so that by any means you may attain to the resurrection of the dead, because the only way to get to his resurrection is to go pass through, is to pass through his death. Okay, so, so he says to know him and to know the power of his resurrection. And so we, our goal is to share, that's the goal of God, is for us to share in his resurrection, to experience intimately the resurrection of Christ. And uh, this is something that we will, in, in its fullness, apart from this body, we will experience that. But spiritually, in its fullness, we already experience that. And the power of his resurrection, in the fact that we experience it now, is... <clears throat> It's, it's at the very heart of what the gospel message is. <coughs> the entirety of the Christian worldview hinges on the resurrection. Uh, when you had the first gospel sermon in Acts 2, you have this mentioned by Peter. It says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to God, uh, to, to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the a definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And of course, we have in 1 Corinthians 15, the significance of the gospel. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So he says if the idea that you can be a Christian and that it's um, a wonderful life now, but then later there's nothing to it because the resurrection isn't real, he says then, then actually you're to be pitied because the Christian life is a life in which we are conforming to the sufferings of Christ. Uh, we do that to access, access his resurrection. But if there is no resurrection and all we're doing is sharing in his sufferings, then we are, we are martyrs with no point. There's, there's, we enter into his sufferings to get nothing, to, to access nothing else. 
But because, and he says here, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, verse 20, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead means that when we enter into his sufferings, it's not in vain, it's not worthless. Because the intention of God is that we access his resurrection by passing through his sufferings. And so there's no point in, it, in sharing in his sufferings if the resurrection isn't a thing, if it's not, didn't, didn't happen, and, it, and, and that we won't experience it one day. Um, and so that's, that's the only path. Uh, one of, you know, the quote that I go back to time to time, uh, C.S. Lewis said, uh, there, there isn't anything that's ever been resurrected that did, first, did not first die. There, there only is a resurrection when you die first. But so then, how is it that we enjoy the resurrection presently? What do you think? How do we enjoy the resurrection presently? Is it just a far off thing? Or when we're united with Him in baptism, we're buried with Him, and we're raised to walk in newness of life, what happens then? And this is where I believe the, the most important aspect of joining in the resurrection of Christ is. That, okay, whether or not, and people debate about what exactly happens to this body in eternity. That's not a debate I want to get into right this second. But the fact of the matter is, is regardless of what happens in eternity with the, my physical body, my spiritual reality is going to remain constant from the time I am united with his sufferings therefore accessing his resurrection from that point to eternity my spiritual status remains the same which means that right now we share in the resurrection because the resurrection of Christ while it is a dead body brought back to life that's not the focus of God for us. The focus of God for us is that we are, we are dead in our sins. And that death is, is a death that is plainly described as we are separated from God because of our sins. We are dead. God makes us alive, but sin separates us, so we're dead. And the resurrection removes the sin and makes us alive in Christ. And so that, that aspect of the resurrection that we already enjoy... I believe is the, it's the most important aspect of the resurrection. You know, re regardless of what heaven will be like, you know, what is the new heavens and the new earth? Uh, what is a spiritual body? Um, you know, a, a spirit is a non-corporeal thing, entity. That means a spirit is something without a body, but we're described as having spiritual bodies. It's sort of like an oxymoron there. It's like, well, I don't know what that means. Okay, we don't have to know what that means because that's not the point. But people get fixated on that aspect of the resurrection when they should be focusing on the here and now component that we share in the resurrection presently in that we were dead, separated from God, but the blood of Christ washed away our sins and it brings us back so that our relationship with God is, is uh, there's no longer a, a breach there, but we're now reconciled. So we're whole and alive again. We were lost, now we're found. Uh, we were dead, now we're alive. That's, that's the resurrection in the, in the moment right now. So then he says, let's see, where am I here? Um, <clears throat> okay, let's go back to, let me see this here. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his share in his sufferings. As I was studying this, uh, what I saw was that the, the verb there, may share, it is, that isn't there. That isn't in any Greek manuscript. Um, what is there is, um, and the fellowship of his sufferings. In other words, that I may know him, that I may know the power of his resurrection, that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings. That's what literally it says in Greek. Now, why then did the English Standard Version, and I don't know what the NIV says, why did they put a verb there that I may share in his sufferings? Because that's not what it says. It just says, if you were to start with to know, that's the verb, to know, 
the fellowship of his suffering. Why do you think they did that? And this is where it gets into how translation committees will debate about what a passage means and how should it be translated. What, is it, what does it mean to, to know the fellowship? And the fellowship there is the term koinonia. That's that union fellowship term, okay? What does it mean that we know the fellowship of his sufferings? Well, as when they're translating it in the English Standard Version, they said, well, to know it is the idea of an intimate and experiential knowledge. So what is an intimate experiential knowledge of the sufferings of Christ? It, well, it means to share in his sufferings. And so they said, well, okay, a more accurate translation of what this really means, the way that we would describe it is you have to experience it. you you got to do it too. That it isn't an, it's just an intellectual, oh, well, I, I know that he went to the cross, okay. No, it's i got to go to the cross too. And that's so they translated it that way, even though it's not a word-for-word -word verbatim. Anyone that tells you you need a word-for-word -word verbatim translation of the Bible, uh, they, just don't, they don't really know about translating. Um, and I, I don't mean that as an insult to someone. What I mean is this, is there are times in which if you translate word-for-word -word something, look, you have two words for know or knowledge in the Greek. You only have one in the English. And so one of those... and means for us to just kind of intellectually know something the other one is to intimately experience with okay and so when it's being translated into english it makes sense to differentiate between the two by saying well if you want to actually know the fellowship of his sufferings what it means is, is that you're actually sharing in his sufferings and so when you look at the discrepancy between the two translations actually what you find is you find the real meaning that the difference that they made is, is that they're teaching what the deeper meaning of it is beyond what would just be a face value English translation. Uh, and so you think about what we do every week. Every week we memorialize the suffering and the death of Christ because that dark day must remain fresh for us. It must, because we, we must continue to share in it. <clears throat> I read this, and it kind of blew my mind. William Barclay says, uh, he says this, he says, whenever, whenever a Christian suffers, whenever he has to bear a cross, you know, that's what Jesus says, right? Matthew 16, he says, if anyone is going to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Barclay says this, whenever a Christian suffers, whenever he has to bear a cross, he is sharing in the suffering of Christ and helping to carry the cross of Christ. That just kind of blew my mind because I'm thinking, okay, wait, hold on a second here. So if we're, if we're actually experiencing with the sufferings of Christ, we're not literally there with him, but when we share with him in the same way that in Romans chapter 12, we're told to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We have a union in the body of Christ. We have a fellowship. We share with one another. That quite literally, say in a spiritual sense, which is still literally, we have, we, we have an opportunity to bear the cross of Christ with him, to stand there with him, to walk with him, to go to the hill with him. To be nailed to the cross with him. That, that's the, that is the opportunity that we have. And that, that is the only path to the resurrection. And so when Bar Barclay said it that way, that, that kind of opened my eyes to the, the idea of we not only have fellowship with one another and bearing each other's load, but in a real sense, Jesus says, well, well you, you got to take up your cross too. And then the way it's described throughout Scripture as far as sharing in his sufferings, that we... We are with him. We identify with him. We, it stays fresh with us. We walk with him. But in, in our own practical everyday ways of emptying ourselves. Remember, you go back to chapter 2. He emptied himself. 
coming in likeness of men, and he was obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's the emptying of himself culminating in death. Therefore, God has raised him and given him the name which is above every name. So then you go to the next chapter, chapter 3, and, he's, and Paul is saying, look, we get to share in that. And sharing in that means that Paul says, I'm going to empty everything that I have. And when I empty everything that I have in the same way that he emptied everything that he had, and I bear my cross with him, then I'm bearing his cross with him as he bears my cross with him. We have this sharing with. And the opposite is true as well. When we don't do that, then we, we do not share his load. Now, it isn't as if Jesus was not able to, to bear his load by himself. Of course, he did. But it's, it's the idea that we are, we are joining in union with the suffering that Christ went through. I'm going to look at this, actually, I'm going to look at these passages in my sermon in just a, in just a little while because, yeah, because it's relevant. Um, let's see here. In <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse starting verse 8, Paul says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So you have the sharing the sharing of one means you're sharing with the other. You're sharing of the sufferings, but you're sharing with his life. Uh, Galatians 6, 17, um, Paul says, for now, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Christ. Now, people think, well, what, is, what does that mean? The, they, you know, this is funny. There are some people that they, they make up these wild kind of claims that well, that, that Paul had, let's see, what's the, what's the name of that? There's actually a name for that, I believe, where someone manifests the, the marks in the hands and the feet and maybe where the crown of thorns was. I'm trying to remember what the name, what that's called. And some people say, well, that, isn't that what happens with Paul here? Well, no, that's not what that means. What, that's not what that means. We know that Paul went through a lot of stuff. I mean, he was, he was beat, he was stoned, he was left for dead. Uh, and all of those bruises and cuts and all of the blood that he shed and everything, he says these marks are the marks of Christ because these in doing this, I'm sharing with his suffering. And because I'm sharing with his suffering, then that means, here's what it means. It means that, and this is, this is not, the, I don't want you to take this as a... Um, heretical statement or blasphemy or something like that but when we, when we truly suffer with Christ when we when we go through the difficulty and we empty ourselves of all the things that are in the way of us in Christ and we we share in that emptying with Christ and then share in the sufferings that go through the loss of those things those injuries that we endure in order that we may know him we can rightly call the injuries of Christ. It's the, oh, so, so someone derided you for your faith or talked down to you. Uh, or maybe you had, to, you had to, to give up something that you really wanted to pursue in life, and now you're having difficulty with certain things. And, that, you know, and it's, it's not necessarily something that's going to be a bruise or a cut or blood, that's, but it's going to be an, an injury of some kind that we... We willingly go through in order to share in the sufferings of Christ. And those injuries that we go through, we can point to those and we can say, those are the injuries of Christ. Because I'm sharing with his suffering. And that's really, that's really a beautiful idea. That, that we have that kind of a union with him. That it isn't, it isn't my injury, that it's the injury of Christ. That I bear in my body. That's what he says. I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. His were physical marks, and ours might be, depending on our situation, the culture, you know, period, time, country we live in, things like that, but typically that won't be. And in 1 Peter 4, 13, Peter says, But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you also may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And so now we have, 
you have this equation of, well, I, I, I've heard of, I've heard that he died for me. I've heard that he was raised from the dead. All right, I have an intellectual knowledge. Okay, now, now I know that I need his death to be a sacrifice for my sins so that I can live forever in his resurrection. So I'm going to unite with him and share in his sufferings, being conformed to his death, so that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Um, you have this anticipation of glory in the same way that in uh, after death, in the same way that in chapter 2, he uh, was obedient to death, even the death of the cross, and God raised him from the dead. God highly exalted him. Uh, in Romans 8, 17, Paul, Paul says, And if, if we're children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, it's conditional, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. We have this common theme throughout the New Testament of a sharing with a, a quite literal sharing with the sufferings to share with the glorification. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, Paul says this saying is trustworthy. And if you read through this, this is sort of a description of the gospel itself. He says, this saying is trustworthy for if we have, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. That there's a glorification. There is a, that's why we're royalty. That we, we are elevated as, as royalty with Christ. And so, becoming like him in his death, let's see here. Uh, when you go back to uh, verse 10, becoming like him in his death, uh, the, that term becoming, it, it means, literally it means be, being conformed to come to be similar in form to something. To share in having the likeness of something. To take on the same form as or to become like. That we are becoming like him in his death. So, uh, you know, how do we become like him in his death? Well, there's the death to self that he mentions in Matthew 16, 24. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. The way that we conform to his death is as he was approaching his death, what was his attitude? You know, Luke twenty two forty two, Not my will, but yours be done that we're, we approach death seeking the will of God. And that's, that's, what, that's what chapter 2 says, that he was obedient to the form of death, even the death of the cross. He was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Uh, that that was, that was him saying, I want to do what the will of the Father is, which is going to death. And so this, is, this becoming like him in his death is the emptying of self that we find in Philippians 2. And we have to imagine that Paul was probably anticipating his death. He didn't know exactly when it would be. He mentions here that perhaps it's not going to be right away, but he knows it's going to happen sometime soon. And so perhaps he's speaking about the manner of death in the sense that um, as Jesus had the resolve, the resolve to lay down his life, that no one would take his life, but that he would be the one to choose to lay it down, that Paul himself would choose to lay it down. He would choose to suffer injury. And that he would not be compelled to, to do it, but that it would be a choice in the same way that Jesus chose to, uh, to go through loss and suffering. So when we think about that for ourselves, you know, we're, we're not on death row like Paul was. When we think about that for ourselves, it means that we resolve to suffer loss. That, that's, that's our choice to do that. And we do that as a manner of identifying with Jesus. So no one takes anything from us. No one compels us. We gladly give up the things that would stand between us and knowing Christ, his death, and his resurrection. And so we empty ourselves of anything and everything that would hinder us from participating in anything that has to do with Jesus and that's, that's, this is significant because our entry into the covenant is described in that very way. Romans 6, starting in verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that 
just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And so Paul is saying here that this union with Christ, it's worth giving up everything for. And that's where we'll end. We got halfway done. We got verse 10. Okay. Anyone have any comments or questions or? Because we shall see him as he is. That's what the last part of it says. And that's really the debate. Um, I mean, I know people that say Jesus is uh, literally the same flesh and blood human being that he was when he walked the earth by the right hand of God in heaven right now. That's a little hard for me to wrap my head around. And so they say, well, because he's that way, and he was that way after the resurrection, then we're going to be like he was. We're just going to have physical bodies walking around like him. I think that's a... I, see, I think that's a leap. What we do know in particular is, is whatever he is, that's what we will be because, very specifically, we've shared with his sufferings and death, which means we'll share with his resurrection, which means that we share in all things Christ. And so Paul says... If there's anything getting in the way of that, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. You've got to give it up. All right, we'll pick up verse 11, I think, next week. I think it's